Michelangelo the sculptor selected the marble for his works of art from Carrara. In a shoe factory a few kilometers from the Carrara marble mines and just north of the impressive city of Monticatini, Antony D'Angelo, the musician from Petraro in Abruzzi, examines the latest trends in shoemaking technology. Although Antony lived in eastern Canada and enjoyed a number of years in Sydney, Australia, British Columbia, Canada is where home is now for the Italian-born musician and shoemaker. And in the garden surrounding his home, with its tall trees and flowers and blossoms, Antony D'Angelo spends as much time as possible with his wife and daughters. The fun in the garden had its beginnings in the early 1950s, when this man of music made the decision to leave the land of his birth and move to a new culture with its different language and customs, always with an ambition to fulfill and a destiny to unfold. Anthony taught music in Toronto high schools, worked in a plastering business, trained a youth orchestra in Sudbury while working in a smelter, in Australia, he became a shoemaker and continued his music, returned to Canada and led the Vancouver Symphony as guest conductor, and like the Canadian collection of Michelangelo models, calls Canada home. Arrivals, departures, hellos, and farewells have been an important part of Antony's life. This farewell is the start of a pilgrimage to where it all began, his hometown of Pretoro and to Rome, where he will meet again Giuseppe Santurbano, a lifelong friend and director now of the Italian Air Force Band, and will conduct the band. During the troubled war years, the Musical Academy of Rome was home to young Antony. Located close by the Vatican, the Michelangelo Dome of St. Peter's, viewed from the Piazza dei Cavalieri di Malta, was a constant reminder of his faith and destiny. His parents were able to arrange for a year's tuition at the prestigious music school on the condition that Antony would have to win a government grant to continue. He did. We have come to pay homage to the destiny of Rome, out of which our destiny has been born and by which it is still in the process of being formed. This city we proclaim as have thousands since the ninth century in their pilgrimage song O Roma nobilis, orbis et domina. O noble Rome, mistress of the world, most excellent and supreme of all cities. Surely, there is no other city in this world of ours where untold and continuing throngs of people arrive day by day as you see and hear them arriving on this day to grasp the essence of the Christian vision of the human unity of all peoples of the world. This is the vision. We, today, accompany our friend, Anthony D'Angelo, to the wellspring of his Christian faith and to the source of his creativity and his destiny. Coming home is always a joyous occasion. For Antony D'Angelo and his friends, Pretoro put on an especially happy face. We were greeted warmly by Don Gino Marini, the parish priest. And for Antony, it was a surge of love and goodwill as old and young alike surrounded and embraced him warmly, while the bells echoed throughout the town from atop the church to mark this occasion under a brilliant sunny sky. An exuberant welcome like this is a magic moment in time, and it is an experience that not many are privileged to be a part of. For Antony D'Angelo, who has spent years on other continents, it is particularly special. The musician and shoemaker is back among his own people. He is home. Welcoming back a native son in Pretoro involves a banquet where good food and drink help friends remember old times. And for Antony and his friends, the gathering filled Los Coyatolo, or the Squirrel, a gathering place in the mountains just above the town. The kitchen was compact but seemed forever busy as a team of experienced people 
very quickly prepared, cooked, arranged, and served a variety of dishes. Antony, occupying a place of honor, joined in the celebrations with his relatives and friends as laughter filled the room. The mood of the celebration was climaxed at the San Andrea Church, where Pretoro was honored with a rare visit by Archbishop Vincenzo Fagiolo of Chieti. The bright sun lit up the square as His Eminence and Antony exchanged warm greetings. In the San Andrea Church, Father Jim Roberts with Don Gino held a joint celebration of the Mass. Here is a portion. My dear Christian friends, no sooner have I said these words than immediately a problem presents itself to my mind. How is it possible that I can use the word friends for you when we really don't know each other thoroughly and for quite a long period of time? It doesn't seem honest. But yet, if I consult my experiences, my concrete and personal experiences since I have arrived here in Pretoro with my friends, I must admit that we have been met by smiles by invitations into your homes, by offers of help of whatever kind, I reflect that these are the indications of a real friendship. And then we belong to the same faith, the Christian faith, which provides the basis for a Christian friendship. So truly in that case, we may be able to call ourselves as we are friends. And most especially, because we have accompanied from a far country one of your own sons back to his own roots, his religious and cultural roots, in an effort to discover once again his own destiny as a Christian. Antony, this is a typical quiet day in your hometown of Pretoro, but I'm sure that maybe almost 40 years ago when the war hit here, as it did uh, a lot of Europe, things were a little bit different. You were a child then. What, what sort of memories does the war bring to you, if any? The war brings a lot of memory. And as you said, the things has changed, of course has changed. It's changed for the better. Because uh, this town, it just, you can't recognize uh, today, uh, 40 years ago, it's completely different. But it's changed for the better, but the memory of the world doesn't go away. There are memories locked in these mountains above Pretoro, which have stood as guardians since time began. But to a young Antony, there have been changes. During the Second World War, they were not covered with the great forests which are flourishing now. It was here that the thoughts of a boy go back to the struggling times of war. During the winter of 1944, in those rare moments when a boy could forget the rigors of war, when snow covered the slopes, Antony and a friend would strap on their skis and make their way down into the valleys. On one particular occasion, they became aware of some unusual sounds, the sounds of suffering. The pair investigated and found concealed deep in a cave a group of soldiers hiding. They had earlier escaped their captors and had become lost in their efforts to find their way back to their comrades. They were starving, and some were on the verge of dying. Antony and his friend had brought a small amount of food with them and gave it to the men, and promised to return with more. When Antony arrived home, his father and mother were told of the soldier's plight, but warned that Pretoro was under occupation. Italy was at war and it would be very dangerous to try and help the soldiers. The decision to help would have to be Antony's alone. Every night under cover of darkness at midnight, long after the curfew, Antony and his backpack, containing whatever food his parents could scrape together, returned to the cave to feed the soldiers, and then in the early morning hours, returned home. Antony kept up his nocturnal visits for almost a month until the soldiers regained their strength and made their way back to their own units. This heroic and humble act of compassion 
moved the men of war to write a note of gratitude to Antony. Each of the men put his name to it, with instructions to deliver it to the Allied commander of the 8th U.S. Army when they liberated the area. When Antony returned from the cave for the last time, it was as usual early morning, and his parents were getting breakfast ready for the family. Mr. D'Angelo, having visited Canada earlier, could read English and told Antony the letter was a very important document and must be hidden from the occupying troops. When the war ended, Antony followed instructions and went to nearby Chieti to the Allied headquarters. The commander, Field Marshal H.R. Alexander, arranged for a reward for the family and presented this citation to Antony for his act of courage and bravery. Antony, uh, a small town like Petoro, I'm wondering, now you're a young musician, you've got your instruments, you want to practice, you want to rehearse. What sort of facilities did a town the size of Petoro have? Did you have a, a band hall where you could practice? Well, certainly we didn't have uh, a theater, nothing of that sort, but we did have a band hall that was only available to us uh, on a Saturday because we used to use uh, a school, an old school, and uh, so Saturday was pretty well free and we used to go there on Saturday. But previous to that, we did enjoy to, to play, uh, for instance, in a balcony uh, where every children, uh, you know, they go up in the balcony and they start to practice a bit and here and there. So fine, then uh, we get together maybe in a uh, little square and uh, we try to put the melody together and that's how it come about. Such were Antony's yesterdays as a youngster, when every morning in Pretoro was brightened by the sounds of music sounding through the streets. Streets whose beginnings go back at least 2,000 years. The people of Pretoro, in many ways, still remind one of the hardy souls of yesterday, sustaining themselves in their tightly knit community in the ways they know best.
The hustle and bustle of the big city is not to be found in Pretoro, where in some spots there are no cars. It's not unusual to see animals on the streets. These beasts of burden are still doing what they have for centuries. Walking is the way to get around to visit friends or do whatever chores are necessary. Dusk in Pretoro brings a different flavor to this colorful town on the mountain. Antony D'Angelo, now the man. musicians of Italy, the time came for him to travel the miles to Rome. The province of Abruzzi has produced an abundance of musical talent. And there is an old proverb that says, if you plant a potato, a musician will grow. So it's natural that Antony, having received his early training in music in Pretoro, would choose Rome to further his career. And coming from the country, he was very excited with the thought of studying in Rome and the impressive credentials of the Musical Academy. Situated in the heart of the city and providing access to the theaters, concert halls, art galleries, and museums, so essential to the training of the complete artist. Antony, you started your musical training in your hometown, naturally enough, of Pretoro, a small town. You've come here to the Musical Academy before us in Rome, a big facility in a big town. Much of a change for you and the other musicians from Pretoro and other small towns? Cosworth. You must consider Pretoro is a little town of 2,000 people, and Rome is a city of 2 million people. But that wasn't so bad, because people's people. The change was on the school itself. The academy had provided such outstanding teachers which that was the adjustment and also the discipline. So it wasn't very simple, but I had set my mind to get an education. So the discipline didn't bother me. I want that education. Tell me, Tony, what different types of music did they offer here at the academy? Well, there's no difference in music. Music's music. Seven notes, seven sharps, seven clefts, seven flats, all this. Depend on the school. The teacher, the discipline, that is music. With the discipline, you achieve music. Now, this school had the most 
perfect teachers. And that's what we have achieved something from this school. Now, being a student has given me the opportunity to travel and meet people in other countries. And that's why today I'm back here to revive. And I can still hear the sound of the children rehearsal inside those two. Here at the Canadian Embassy in Rome, Desmond and Gwen Hobig, as friends of Antony D'Angelo, will perform at a special recital. Between them, this Vancouver brother and sister have won many prestigious awards and competitions and are acquiring an international reputation. They are students at Juilliard in New York. What a great pleasure to invite two Canadian friends from Vancouver, BC, Canada, to Italy at the Canadian Embassy. And now they're going to perform Passacaglia by Andal Harverson.
Leaving Rome is always done with great reluctance because the Eternal City is filled with sights to enjoy. The Piazza Navona is one of many that welcomes a few moments to savor the sights and sounds. But for Antony, it is necessary to leave and move north to Monticatini, for he has business to attend to. At the Hotel Terme Pellegrini, Roof Garden, Antony and Luigi Natoli spend a few moments discussing some of the latest news relating to their shoemaking interests. Sono stato presentati a Milano. A Milano, hanno avuto abbastanza successo, sì. E sono, sono componenti, componenti ormai sono fatti a mano. E i vari componenti non si possono praticamente vendere, il cliente li può assemblare tutti scoperti. Questo è anche molto interessante. Questo è carino, come lo fanno questo qui a mano? Just outside of Montecatini are a number of towns surrounded by vineyards, olive groves and small farms which house the factories that produce shoes that lead the fashion parade around the globe. And a visit is on the agenda to two modern component producing factories in Certaldo. This is where the most visible part of a woman's shoe begins. Brightly colored rolls of material go in one end of a machine and come out as a continuous strip. These are known as spaghetti strips. Other machines apply glue and an unbreakable string, which is closed inside the material. This ensures the strength and durability of the product. These trendsetting machines are designed and produced in Italy and are the last word in advanced technology. This material is then brought to another area, moving from a skilled machine to skillful hands where it's braided into a variety of designs. With a few deft movements, with many selections of material, a fashionable design soon emerges, and as a finished upper, it will be the basis for a very smart shoe for Milady. Next door to the plant, which turns out complete uppers, is another which concentrates entirely on insoles. This all begins with sheets of material looking much like wall panels, which are punched out into the required shape. Responding to specific requests from the customer, the basic insole is first fitted precisely with a shank. The next machine then automatically assembles the shank on the rest of the insole for a complete unit. Later, the product is shaped and covered, if that is asked for, and leaving the building are the completed insole parts. It is here that Antony makes his final choices of color and shape of various uppers and insoles which will influence the fashion trends of the coming season. From the activity of the factories to the serenity of the mountains is a necessary step for Antony the musician from the Abruzzi mountains. It is at the cave of Fantiscritti in Carrara that Michelangelo went to find material. Man's struggle to try and move mountains is always a difficult one, but it's a struggle we all apply ourselves to and all succeed in some measure. Behold the paradox. Italy, cradle of our culture, land born of primeval Etruscan, Greek, and sinewy Latin roots, Land of lovers, of liquid song, and patron of all the arts, has a heart of stone. Its name is Carrara, here in the declining lap of the Apuan Alps. 
the silence of this natural cathedral is continually broken by the whirr of drills, the staccato sound that proceeds from the breaking up of the marble, and the huge trucks as they rumble down the mountainsides carrying their burdens, which will eventually find their homes in churches and homes of people throughout the entire world. Though of the starkest stone, adamantine marble, this heart has for centuries yielded to the creative hand of the sculptor to gift the world with supple form. Michelangelo is the greatest example of the Italian Renaissance sculptors whose destiny started with the formless shapes of the Carrara marble. He was such a thorough artisan that he created models in terracotta before attempting his priceless works of art. The outstanding collection of these models in the world today, called the Canadian Collection, was originally the property of a Michelangelo contemporary, Paul von Praun. These small, exquisite works of art in themselves show us how their use inspired him to produce many of his enormous and famous sculptures. This lower back and left thigh of a reclining figure was used as a study for the night at the tomb of Giuliano de' Medici in Florence. This is a study for the left arm, shoulder, and back of evening, the tomb of Lorenzo de' Medici. Also for Lorenzo de' Medici, Michelangelo created this study for the right hand. And this study of a right arm was for evening at the Lorenzo de' Medici tomb. The Medici Chapel in Florence includes some of Michelangelo's greatest sculpture. This is a study for the right leg of Giuliano de' Medici, Duke of Nemours. A right wrist and clasping hand. This right leg was possibly a study applied in reverse to the risen Christ. For the Giuliano de' Medici tomb, the unfinished left hand of night. This is a right thigh, knee, and part of a male body. Again for the Giuliano de' Medici tomb is this study of a left hand. And this study for the right hand of Don, the tomb of Lorenzo de' Medici. From these models, we have glimpsed the vision that Michelangelo saw locked in this marble. The best artist, he wrote as his artistic creed, does not crudely impose himself upon the stone, but from the pietra alpestra e dura, from the hard alpine stone, he may draw out that which lies dormant within, una viva figura, a living form. In his dialogues, Michelangelo summed up his vocation as a Christian artist when he said that good art is nothing but a replica of the perfections of God and a reflection of his art. It is, above all, a harmony and a melody. Antony conducts Pastorel for Three Clarinets by Scarlatti.
the genius and destiny of Michelangelo was to free dynamic beauty from the material of stone, of paint, and of words. The one gift that he knew was denied him was the gift of music. Antony conducts in festo transfiguration domino by Palestrina. the beauty of the art we have been seeing and hearing, both from the past through Master Michelangelo and from the present through Anthony D'Angelo, has any value for the rest of us. Surely it is to provide for us the impetus to respect, to explore, and to fulfill our own personal destinies, to reverence the drama of our own lives. It is the Christian ideal in the words of Dante, in the opening lines of his Paradiso, to do this per la gloria di colui che tutto muove, for the glory of him who moves all things. Antony accepts the baton from maestro Captain Giuseppe Santurbano, a friend since childhood who leads the impressive Italian Air Force Band. He performs a medley arranged by Richard Heyman. Three songs in which Antony pays homage to the countries which have helped him fulfill his dreams of success and his destiny. He begins with O Sole Mio, long associated with sunny Italy. Then waltzing Matilda, the traditional Australian folk song and concluding with the youngest of the three, the warm and melodic Canadian sunset.
Meanwhile, Maestro D'Angelo and the Italian Air Force Band and Giuseppe Verdi's rousing overture to La Forza del Destino.
destiny is intensely personal. Ours may not lie in music or art or sculpture, but whatever it becomes, we each have within us the power to respect the unique destiny that is our very own and give it free reign to move ahead and flourish.